Thank you for the fine introduction, Corinne. Uh, again, my name is Stuart Robles with Boost Performance, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about sales. Sales, sales, sales. Five actionable strategies for sales growth. Knowledge is power? Don't believe that. Knowledge is not power. The application of that knowledge is power. So if you find something that you find interesting today, jot it down, do some little more research, take action. That's the way you put it to good use. Put it to good use. All right. So as mentioned, a little bit of my background. We had some great speakers this morning that touched on a few of the things that uh, I'll probably cover today as well. Uh, Micah Turner, if you heard him earlier this, uh, this morning before lunch, he spoke about selling value and the importance of selling value as opposed to selling on price. Still hear me? Yeah, good. And we also heard from Sean Patton. He talked about from uh, a leadership perspective based on his time uh, leading troops in special forces about the impact that leadership has on teams. And I'm going to cover that as well from a sales leadership perspective. A few of the things that, uh, that Sean had mentioned that really resonated with, with me was three things. One, if you can get very efficient at leadership, sales, and public speaking, you're going to be very effective. And it's going to go a long way into the success, not only your success, but everybody around you's success. Which reminds me, every time I get in front of a crowd, of my experience with the latter, public speaking. My first public speaking came as I had literally just rolled off the boat. And I, the boat, I'm talking about the USS Ohio, which is a Trident submarine, the first of its class, the Ohio class submarine. I was uh, finished with a sea tour that I'd spent six uh, Trident patrols on and was up for shore duty and came to Houston, my wife's hometown. So uh, got attached to the recruiting district and I was there to replace a couple of chiefs uh, who were also Navy nukes. And essentially what my mission was is to go out and talk to kids in the high schools, junior high schools, kids much like myself. When I uh, came out of high school, had some pretty good grades, took the right math and science classes, but either didn't have the means or the desire to go right into a university or college. So those are the folks that uh, we kind of designed and the Chiefs did an excellent job of designing a nice little talk about nuclear power, the benefits of nuclear power, the safety of nuclear power, how the technology is different than the technology in a nuclear bomb. Nuclear power plants will not blow up. Just, they don't happen, it doesn't happen. Technology is not there. And that's one of the things you had to explain to some of the kids because, you know, there was a little bit of fear factor uh, when you talk about nuclear power. And so that's what we did. And uh, they had put together, like I said, a nice little presentation. I listened to it for a few times. They were getting ready to roll back out to a submarine. It was now my job to talk to these kids. So they gave me the opportunity. Well, being in the position that I was, I'd never had the opportunity to speak to uh, an auditorium full of anybody before. And uh, well, that first opportunity did not go so well. I literally, you know, had memorized the presentation, which was about an hour long. I think I got about uh, two paragraphs into what I thought I'd memorized. And I froze. Like a deer in headlights. Like a deer in a motorcycle headlight on a dark Texas Hill Country Road, which, by the way, is not just scary for the deer. Don't ask me how I know that. But I froze, but it was a, a really the first truly great lesson that I had that propelled me into a sales career. 
One, I learned that it's okay to fail. It's okay to get out of your comfort zone and not be comfortable and to not succeed. But if you have commitment and you have a desire to, for that success, well then you get back on the horse. And that's what I did. So the next week I went out there, got in front of that crowd, did a little better, did a little better, continued to do better to the point where I finally made it my own. I got the opportunity to speak on a very regular basis, as in giving five or six one-hour presentations to physics and chemistry kids in high schools and junior colleges throughout the day. So I was doing this many, many times and was very successful, so successful that I won quite a few awards uh, in recruiting for the Navy in the nuclear power program. Uh, it helped that it was the late 80s uh, into the early 90s in Houston, which is where I was. A lot of smart kids didn't have the means. You know, a lot of, a lot of people got hit pretty hard by the oil and gas issue that, that occurred in the 80s. But the combination of the two allowed me to be successful. And that's why I decided when I got out of uh, that recruiting tour and decided which direction I was going to go in. Uh, instead of going to work for a nuclear power plant, I had job offers there. Instead of going to work for the, one of the 132 um, petrochemical and refinery uh, complexes that are on the Houston Ship Channel, I was going into sales. I wanted to make that type of impact. And uh, I was having fun. So I took a 100% commission sales in the building and construction industry, which is essentially construction office trailers and module buildings. Uh, was successful, rose to the top, got lots of awards, and worked my way up through sales management, sales leadership. Uh, went and worked for a structural steel fabrication firm, leading sales and business development. Finally, got lured away by a civil engineering firm wanting to bust into that market, that market that I did not go into initially, but I had made a great living off of through the sales route. Uh, they wanted to get into the industrial side of, of uh, the business and start working with the Exxons and the Chevrons and the CP Chems and the Lyondells and the Dows, which, is the, which was my clientele at the time. I had gotten pretty good at creating master service agreements and uh, getting work from them. So that, uh, that was kind of my journey on how I uh, kind of got into the sales piece. Uh, Sean Patton also brought up another great point. If you can find Navy veterans, or not just Navy veterans, but any veterans, they've got some, some pretty good traits. And one of them is they have a desire to be successful. And that's a key trait. So if you can find them, and by the way, I can help you find them. Uh, there's some great places. You just got to screen for them right, and have your roles set up correctly, and they make great salespeople. I'm living proof. So here you go. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk a little bit about world-class sales organization. What does that mean exactly? We're going to talk about sales leadership and sales management the impact that they have on the company and what impact that that coaching and accountability and KPIs have and what you should be tracking and why it's so important. And then that last piece, we'll talk a little bit about recruiting. One of the big challenges for many companies trying to build a world-class sales organization, not just how to find them, but how to keep them. We'll get into that. So what is a world-class sales organization? What is that, that mythical term? Well, it's what a lot of companies aspire to. Some companies claim to be there already. You're more likely to hear those claims out of large enterprise companies. But the odds are you have a better chance of finding it in small to medium-sized companies. 
Some people would say a world class sales organization has to do with the people. Others would say it's about the results, the revenue. While others would claim that it's about the size of the organization, still a few would point to leadership. There's quite a few components that make up a world class sales organization. In the larger companies, usually have one or more people responsible for those components. What I want to talk about is the smaller company, the smaller to mid-sized company. A company that has, oh, half a dozen salespeople, maybe a sales manager, where that one sales manager or sales leader is responsible for all the components of a world-class sales organization. How does one person effectively handle not just the sales leadership, but the sales architecture and the sales infrastructure, which you can define as putting together a great sales process, the implementation of it, the implementation of a CRM system, all the other sales enablement and automation tools that go along with that. Sales talent management, sales enablement, which has to do with sales leadership and coaching, sales management training and coaching, and then sales human capital, which is essentially the process of putting together a world-class sales recruiting program, knowing how to screen for them, source them, interview them, and how to onboard them. It's a lot. It's a lot for one person. In a lot of companies, large and small, a lot of the components are either missing or they're not executed very well. Now's a good time to take a look at your organizations and figure out what work needs to be done and how do we fix it. A lot of folks point to sales training. Hey, that'll fix our problem. We'll just go out and get some sales training. That, that'll start helping us put things in place. And I'm telling you right now, as somebody who does and provides sales training, that is not the answer. That is not the answer. Think of it this way. You just bought that big brand new 4K screen TV, put it up on the wall. Then you hooked up your intermittent, sketchy internet connection that exasperates the picture, and the big screen just makes it more obvious that you got a bad connection. Bringing it back to sales. Maybe you went out and got that CRM system, but your salespeople aren't using it the way you'd hoped. And now you really don't know, and you don't have the information required and the real-time data needed to fill and populate those dashboards that they give you on that CRM system. And you still don't really know what's going on with your sales organization, your people, their pipelines, and their forecasts. Maybe you went out and got that sales training, but that didn't have the effect that you'd hoped for. While sales training may have given them the skills that they needed, it doesn't move the needle because it wasn't targeted. You didn't really understand what you needed was sales transformation. While sales training alone can be part of that sales transformation, in and of itself, it usually underperforms. Why? Well, you can give Kay the skills she needs, the sales training skills she needs, but if you don't have a customized, optimized sales process and she doesn't know 
when to use those newfound skills in the right context, in the right order, at the right time. And you have a sales manager who are particularly challenged to coach salespeople. that's not able to put it all together, well, K needs to be part of a sales transformation effort. Lee, Lee continues to do things his way. And you don't have a sales manager strong enough to make him do it the company's way. Lee will continue to perform inconsistently and Lee needs to be part of a sales transformation effort. You've got Bill. Well, Bill, he doesn't believe that what you've given him in the sales training is going to work on his customers. He doesn't believe that what you've given him in that sales training will be effective because he doesn't believe he can have those types of conversations. Bill needs to be part of a sales transformation effort. And Greg, Greg has self-limiting beliefs that doesn't allow him to have the kind of conversations that he's learned in the sales training. And if your sales manager isn't strong enough to overcome those objections, well, that all needs to be part of a sales transformation effort. Perhaps your salespeople are having problems getting new prospects. And that requires some training on how to set those appointments. But also, what it may require is new messaging for those conversations. And all that is part of a new a sales transformation effort. You see, in and of itself, sales training is nice to have, but it usually does not move the needle. And it doesn't move the needle because many times it's not addressing the underlying issues that are really behind the issues that you're having with your sales team. If you decide to do a sales transformation, now you have targeted areas that you work on that will move the needle and do uncover the underlying issues. How do we get there? How do we identify them? Well, a great place to start is a sales force analysis, an objective database driven analysis of your sales team or your sales organization. To find out where the best use of your time, energy and money occurs. You know, I met with a CEO last month and his sales team was not closing enough business. We had just performed a Salesforce analysis and I had the data, had the explanations as to why this was occurring. But before I could jump in and explain exactly what was going on with this sales organization, he jumped in and said, I know what we need to do. We are going to create a new pitch deck and lower our prices. That will solve the problem. But we weren't talking about a small reduction in pricing either. We were talking about, he was, sounded like an, about an 80% reduction in pricing. And the reasoning for that reduction overlapped with what we had found in the Salesforce analysis. What we had found was his salespeople weren't reaching decision makers. But there are a lot of reasons why. So that's the question that needed to be answered. Why were not they reaching decision makers? And it's not unusual for salespeople to reach, fall short of, when trying to reach decision makers. But there are usually several potential reasons why. Could be tactical. They simply don't know how to get to the decision maker and get them engaged. Could be conceptual. 
They don't think they need to. Could be sales DNA. These are specific weaknesses that won't allow them to get to this uh, decision maker and, and engaged. Could be fear. They're just not comfortable speaking with that level of decision maker. Could be their title that intimidates them. Could be commitment. When the tough gets, when the, when it, when the, get, uh, it gets rough going, they quit. They're good when it's easy, but when it becomes difficult for them, they bail. Well, so what, does, what did the uh, data tell us about this particular sales team? Well, as far as their sales DNA and reaching decision makers, it's okay. The fear factor and their commitment factors were okay too. But what we had found is that if the sales DNA was okay, the fear factors and the commitment was okay, then it had to be an issue with the management. It's an accountability and coaching and training issue. The management didn't require them to talk to decision makers. They also had some other issues when it came to sales DNA as it related to money and decision making. The amount of money they charging, their salespeople thought was a lot. Well, What's going to be a lot too is the reduced amount. Doesn't matter. Because they understood, or they thought they understood, that when they brought that pricing up, the folks that they were talking to had no interest in bringing that to the decision maker. They had empathy. Empathy is a good thing, unless it's that type of empathy. So they had some issues. What's the solution? Well, the appropriate solution would be for us to work with the sales team to overcome these issues of getting to the decision maker, and get effective at getting, getting them engaged and selling the value of their offering, and then helping sales management to coach to those outcomes. Would lowering the price work? Well, the reasoning for lowering the price, or so the, th the CEO thought, was that they could now give a lower price where the folks that their salespeople were talking to would have approval and authority to sign at the lower price. Could that work? Well, in my experience, if your salespeople aren't getting to the decision maker, it doesn't matter what price you're charging them. If you're not getting the decision makers engaged, you're gonna lengthen your sales cycle and you're gonna have lower margins. So if they were to proceed with lowering their price at 80%, and even if they were successful at closing instead of one in 10, three in 10, they're still about 65% of the revenue behind. Instead, on the other hand, if they were to fix the issue, get the decision makers engaged and learn how to do that, their sales cycles were shortened. They'd close three to five times more business at the original fees that they were charging and thus getting three to five times the revenue. So the question that always needs to be answered is this. Should you do what's easiest and lower the fees or do what's good for the company and fix the problem? It's an easy uh, question to answer unless you're the one who's responsible for making those decisions and the future of the company rests in your hands.
You know, I was a keynote speaker last month at a executive luncheon for about 75 CEOs. Um, just the usual, typical crowd responded in a typical way, except for a couple. One attendee, not a CEO, brought up the fact that how do you get salespeople who appear to be a good fit to actually succeed? And while he mentioned that, he also said, yeah, I want to fix this problem, but we're not willing to change systems, processes, sequencing, sales management involvement, anything. So consider this analogy. He's sick, he's taking meds, and the meds aren't working. The doctor prescribes new meds, but he insists on continuing to take the old meds that aren't working, even though he admitted they're not working. Stupid. I'm only if we grade them. Another attendee, also not a CEO, mentioned that how does he, he asked, how does he get his people to use the sales automation tools that they had in place? I explained to him the power of using accountability as a condition of employment to get compliance. He, came, he countered with the lame excuse that his top salespeople would probably leave. I explained to him that most accountability measures aren't for your top salespeople who are producing. They're for your B's and C players. He came back and said, well, I can't have different rules for different people. So change the rules. He said he couldn't. Stupid. Only if we grade him. You know, he had agreed with about everything else I'd said in those, uh, in those two hours. And it's typical of excuse makers. They'll, dis they'll discount two minutes of information out of two hours of content to justify their previously bad decisions. Even though they've admitted they're not working. And this is the problem with sales leadership. They think they know all the answers, when in fact they don't even know the right questions. Note to sales managers, if you don't know, ask, listen, and act. Note to CEOs. Don't believe that if your sales, just because your sales managers are in that position, they actually know what to do and how to execute the strategies that would make them effective to help your sales team. Most sales managers do not. They are the most undertrained sector we see. They simply do not have the training and capacity to be successful to make an impact on their sales force. So sales management, next topic, big one. I see bad ones all the time. It's not that they're bad people. They sometimes weren't bad salespeople. But they simply do not have the skill sets necessary or know how to make that impact on their sales team. A couple of big reasons why. One, sales management is a full-time position. And yet, most sales managers are still selling. Whether it's their choice or the executive leadership's choice, it's still a bad choice. Because these sales managers are always going to be more concerned about their sales, their prospects, their deals, their commissions. And coaching for impact and development on the rest of the sales team is going to be an afterthought. And quite often, number two, executive leadership fails to understand what the actual role of the sales manager should be. 
As a result, they let the sales manager define their own roles with the less than desirable outcomes. So what should sales managers be doing? Well, here's some numbers. We've evaluated about 2.1 million salespeople, about 10% of those have been sales management. What do we find? From that data, sales managers who shouldn't be in management, plus the sales managers who are not trainable, make up more than 50% of the management, sales managers that we have evaluated. Only 7% are elite. They know what to do, and they do it impactfully and skillfully. It's a sadfully small number, but I guess that's why they're elite. But the bigger concern is 50%, over 50% are ineffective sales managers. So what should they be doing? Here are my top 10 competencies for sales managers. In no particular order. Coaching, accountability, motivation, recruiting, development, leadership, relationships, tactics, strategies, and systems and processes. Anybody want to name the top three? Any guesses? Well, I can tell you what the top two are, as long as they're at the top, coaching and accountability. They have the two biggest impacts on the sales floor. The rest depend upon what your specific goals are, can be ordered in any direction, but coaching and accountability. What's not on the list is almost as important as what's on the list. Personal sales. Account management, closing deals for others. Also not in my top 10, territory management, paperwork, trips, travel, meetings. Well, they need to do some aspect of it. Does not fall in the top 10. So why coaching? What does the data tell us? And not just any coaching, we're talking about impactful coaching. Well, here are some more numbers. If your sales manager spends 50% of his time coaching, whether he's effective or not, his salespeople will be 28% more effective. If he's effective at coaching, but doesn't coach very much, his salespeople will be 16% more effective. But if you can get him to do both, salespeople will be 49% more effective at their job. That is a huge impact for just one sales management competency. So what does impactful coaching look like? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like and what you'll hear most often. You'll hear sales managers say, close more sales, qualify leads better, make more appointments, ask better questions, ask for more money, go back and try again, get it closed before the end of month, end of quarter. Give them a discount, close the deal. Instead, in its simplest form, sales coaching consists of these two key elements. The pre-call strategy, coaching prior to the selected call, to make sure that the salesperson has a good reason for the upcoming call, knows what the desired outcome is, has the game plan and the strategy, the appropriate questions and dialogue to achieve the desired outcome. And then the other side of this, on the other end of the spectrum, coming out of that, the post-call debrief. Coaching after the selected call, discover the outcome of the call, why the salesperson got that outcome, and what they could have done differently and more effectively. And when you have a good sales process in place, and both salespeople and sales managers are speaking the same language and they can identify exactly where they are in the sales process, this really, really starts to make sense and really gets effective. And then how do we track it? Accounting 
And what numbers should we be looking at? Well, accountability and KPIs. We know selling is a numbers game, but most of the time we're looking at the wrong numbers. We're tracking revenue, we're tracking margins, number of accounts, average sale, revenue by salesperson, all lagging indicators. Not very effective. It's good to have some of those numbers, but if you're coaching and managing for impact, wrong numbers to look at. Instead, leading indicators. If you want new business from new accounts, look at it. If you want new opportunities from your existing accounts, start tracking it. On the left-hand column there, you'll see a good outline for a good sales process when you start tracking, uh, tracking attempts to contacts, contacts to conversations, how many of those conversations turned into actual appointments, how many of those appointments turned into first meetings where you know they had a, a need, and then took them through the rest of the sales prospects and actually turned a suspect into a qualified, closable opportunity. Those are the numbers you gotta, you gotta look at. And when you start thinking about the conversion ratios in between each of those, now you're getting somewhere. Now you're figuring out, as a sales manager, how to head things off at the pass before they get, before your salespeople get in trouble. It's huge. Track the right KPIs. Track the right numbers. How do you track those numbers? One of the best communication tools that a company can employ are huddles. If you can make them daily huddles, even better. That's where you can dive into the numbers that you're tracking. You don't have to track them all in the huddle, but the ones that are most important to you at that time. Start going to town. Hey, salespeople like huddles. Some salespeople love huddles. We got an entire generation coming up from the millennial generation. They are motivated a little bit differently than some of us older guys who are historically extrinsically motivated. We're motivated by the money, the cars, the shiny objects, where millennials on down, they're more intrinsically motivated. They want to feel a part of something bigger than themselves. They like that team spirit. Leaves them uplifted and energized. Sales managers love huddles. Creates pure and data accountability, builds bonds and energizes the group, and provides that daily conduit to provide strategy, direction, and clarity to the team. Of course, if it's run poorly, nobody loves them. Right? Too much, it's not motivating. There's just a lot of criticism too negative, it's not gonna work out well. If they run too long, they should be quick hitters. Nobody can plan around them if they run too long. Don't do them. And if the types of things that are being reported on the huddles are inconsistent with what you're actually looking for, then it's a big, boring waste of time. So do it right. Do it right. What he's trying to say is that uh our new brake pads are really cool. You're not even going to believe it. Like, um, let's say you're driving along the road with your family, and you're driving along, la la la, woo. And then all of a sudden, there's a truck tire in the middle of the road, and you hit the brakes. Whoa, that was close. <laughs> now let's see what happens when you're driving with the other guy's brake pads. You're driving along, you're driving along, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling from the back seat, I gotta go to the bathroom, Daddy. Not now, damn it. Truck tire. I can't stop. Help. Help. There's a cliff. And your family's screaming, Oh, my God, we're burning alive. No, I can't feel my legs. Here comes a meat wagon. wee wee and the medic gets out and says, oh my God. New guy's in the corner puking his guts out. <laughs> All because you want to save a couple extra pennies. And <laughs> to me, it doesn't get out. Now. Sir. Do you validate? No. 
Okay, thank you. Not the best example of selling value of your product, right? But this is another great example of the cost of a bad hire, which, of course, nobody in this room has ever suffered from, right? Yeah. It's a big challenge hiring great salespeople. You gotta think of them and hire them differently than you hire anybody else. From top to bottom, including how you get them trained up. Tommy Boy was another great example of a ride along with uh, a good salesperson and they thought that was gonna be effective. It was not. So why do you sales hires fail? Why do you salespeople, even ones that are highly recommended, not succeed. So I'm going to go back to the sales manager. They are the biggest determining factor of the success or failure of a sales new salesperson. One, supervision. Particularly in our environment today, we got a lot of remote salespeople. You ought to be making sure that the sales management is really looking after a new salesperson and gets even more important when they're remote and lack of setting the proper expectations having a good ramp up playbook setting the expectations for 30 60 90 days out and knowing what KPIs that sh they should be uh, accomplishing in those first 30 60 90 days as part of that ramp up playbook and then motivation. And one of our speakers touched on motivation earlier today. Here's a little different take on, on the expectations from a sales manager. Great sales managers who can motivate properly, get salespeople to do what they won't do on their own. They can change their behaviors. They can do more of what they're already doing good and have more sense of urgency. And they'll let, allow them to overachieve. And again, going back to the KPIs, if your sales managers are tracking the wrong ones, the lagging indicators, it's already too late to help those salespeople. If they're tracking the right leading indicators, they can head issues off at the pass. Huge difference. Some of the factors that we look for for successful salespeople, we have the ability to measure. Do they have a strong desire? Do they have strong commitment? Do they make excuses? I'm going to talk about excuse making. When something goes wrong, do they look outward at the economy, at the company, at their sales manager, or do they look inward and say, maybe I could ask some better questions. Maybe I can approach it with a different strategy. Self-starters, they can work independently. They will hunt for business. They'll prospect, no need for approval. That's an interesting one, need for approval. Everybody thinks salespeople ought to be buddy-buddy with their prospects, in which while in a long-term relationship, they can get there. What we're talking about here is early in the sales process, where if they have this need to be liked, they need that approval, they are not gonna ask the right consultative challenging questions that are required to get to the emotional buying level of the prospect and get around objections. They will not challenge. They won't want to offend. It's much better to be respected than liked early on in the sales process. You need salespeople who can do that. Can they recover from rejection? If you need them to hunt and they get knocked down, how quickly do they recover from that knockdown? Do they have effective time management? Can they work without supervision? And do they not just prospect, but do they do it consistently? We measure 21 sales core competencies. And these sales competencies are the biggest differentiator from the elite, the top 10%, versus the average on the left-hand side. Hunting skills, reaching decision makers, relationship building, consultative selling skills, and the ability to sell value. These are the difference makers. And lastly, I'll cover top 10 steps to recruit new sales talent. One, lesson one, 
always be recruiting. Don't wait till you have to recruit. Don't wait till you have to fill a territory because you're going to pick a substandard, not optimal salesperson because you need to fill that. There's opportunity cost when you're trying to fill something. And if you've waited too long, well, you're more likely to accept mediocrity instead of continuing to hunt for, this, for the A player. So always be recruiting. And it helps if you've got a solid recruiting plan in place to do it. Number two, ignore the job description. If you look at Indeed, any other job board, you'll see a job description filling the pages. 95% of the ads out there are the job description. Boring. And it's not what salespeople are looking for. They're looking for the killer ad. They're looking for an ad that puts them in that position. They see themselves, not just the, the rewards, but the challenges. They see themselves because you're letting them know who they need to sell to, how much you need to sell, the volume, any number of things. We write a Shackleton ad. Anybody know Ernest Shackleton? He's 1914, went down with a crew to Ant, uh, uh, Antarctica on a transverse Antarctica and uh, got stuck. Got stuck for over a year. But he wrote the right ad and attracted the right people. He essentially told them, hey, great rewards, but you could die, right? And the people that answered that were looking for that type of adventure. And that's what you need in a sales ad. By the way, every one of them survived, trapped in the Antarctic ice for over a year. And then sourcing. Two big places for sourcing for sales, great salespeople. Uh, for active lookers, LinkedIn, 20 times better than every other, uh, every other job board out there. And for the past, uh, sorry, not LinkedIn, Indeed for the active lookers. And for the passive lookers, the ones who may fit your bill, to have the right skill sets, but may not be actively looking, you can find them on LinkedIn, screen them out. And I'll add a third, um, especially uh, something that Sean Patton mentioned this morning. If you're looking for veterans, go out and source them. There's a lot of great transition officers um, on basis and great place to find them. And then you want to automate the process, save you time, energy, and money. There's a lot of great automation tools. Get your tech stack in place. And then use a great filtering school, a, a screening tool. One that you can put in place that has 95% success rate to find the right salesperson. They're out there. If you had a crystal ball and you knew every salesperson that you hired would succeed, how many would you hire? All of them, right? All of them is the right answer. And then learn how to conduct the interview process, starting with a phone screen. That first five minute phone screen should not be telling them about your company and what your expectations are. It should be putting them on audition. It should be high pressure, intense for them, because that's what they face day in and day out. These are salespeople. And you wanna hear if they actually sound like somebody you want them to represent your company. It's the two to phone screen. And then that first face-to-face -face interview. Don't do it like you've done it before. Tell them about the company, try to get a feel for how they are. No, this is another audition. You gotta put them under pressure again. You gotta make them own everything on their resume, all their claims, get behind those claims. If they took the screening test, you're gonna have some very enlightening questions for them to answer based on the screening. And then see, and then have a scorecard in place so you can score them properly. 
That final interview is actually where you sell the company. They've passed all of this filtering. When you get to the final interview, now you sell them. Now you sell them on the opportunity. And then the last piece, 90-day onboarding plan. This is the ramp up playbook. Without this in place, you may be able to find those A players, but you're not gonna be able to retain them. The A players wanna be supported with that type of guidance. Your Bs and Cs don't care. But the A players wanna be plugged into a system that actually supports them and helps them succeed. And that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. And I got 48 seconds still left. Any questions? Anybody have any questions about any, anything I mentioned here today? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> the cube, throw it at her. She, she likes. It's on though. There you go. Yep, okay. If you have eight salesmen in your team, and they're all different. They like the humans are all different. Some are outgoing, some are introverts, some are calm, some are agitated. How do you apply this method to fit? Do you change your method to fit the human, or does the human fit the method? Well, first you identify, and what we can do with a Salesforce analysis is really understand what drives them and what's motivating what's motivating them. Part of that motivation as I mentioned, helps sales leadership and sales management determine the best way forward with those particular folks based on their skill set. Uh, and motivation is a big one, right? Not just how motivated they are, but what they're motivated by. So once you understand the what behind the motivation, then you can tailor the incentives, the compensation plans, and any number of things that will be tailored towards them. And yes, there's nothing in the rule book that says you've got to treat them all the same, as I mentioned earlier, right? You want to be able to tailor uh, your approach. And if you've got the data and the science and it's out there to help you guide with that, it makes that much, much easier. If you don't, it's a little bit more challenging, especially the larger the sales teams get. Yeah. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Anybody else with any questions? Well, that's all I got. Uh, I will be around this evening and probably hanging out at the bar. So if you have some questions you'd like to ask on a more personal level, feel free. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Take care.